So Coleridge craved intimacy. We can look at his poems from the 1790s. Almost all of the really great ones, the ones we remember most affectionately, explore the problem of overcoming isolation and entering into joyful communion. The poem, eventually titled Alien Harp, uh, dramatizes Coleridge's need for intimacy. Uh, Not just intimacy one-on-one with another person, but indeed intimacy with the entire environment, indeed intimacy with the entire cosmos. In that poem, he imagines himself uh, lying on a cot uh, with Sarah, Uh, This would be um, based on Sarah Fricker, uh, who would become his wife very soon. And Coleridge imagines the the wind blowing through the alien harp um, in the window, striking strings into sound. He imagined this, this wind as a kind of animating breeze that ultimately turns everything in the world into a harp. Um, everything is animated by some unifying breeze. Uh, This would suggest, as the poem does, that God is everywhere. There's a pantheistic sense to this poem. Uh, Coleridge dramatizes Sarah looking at him reprovingly as if to say, you can't say everything is God because that would mean you are God and you are a sinner. And Coleridge imagines himself sort of backing down from that. Um, this grand organic vision of everything being an animated harp. So for Coleridge, sin would be a marker of isolation, um, being separate from your environment, feeling as if you are at odds with the people around you, at odds with the, the natural environment, at odds indeed again with the entire world. So we can look at another poem, um, This Lime Tree Bower My Prison, where we see Coleridge uh, imagining himself in a lime tree bower and, um, alone, and his friends have gone out on this long hike am- among the Quantock Hills. These friends would be Dorothy and William Wordsworth and Charles Lamb visiting from London. Um, the background of that poem is that Coleridge um, had milk poured on his foot, hot milk, accidentally by his wife Sarah, and he could not go. But in the course of the poem, he imagines what his friends are doing. He empathetically enters into the sights he thinks they are experiencing. And so by the end of the poem, even though he is separate from them physically, he feels connected connected to them imaginatively and emotionally. And this is symbolized by a a bird flying over um, the poet's head. I mean, he blesses this bird, a rook, Uh, because he knows that this bird will fly over the head of his friends too. So there's this overcoming of isolation into unity. The same occurs in the conversation poem, uh, Frost at Midnight, where Coleridge imagines himself as an adult uh, looking at his small baby. This would be Hartley. And Coleridge thinking of his own life, where he felt disconnected from his parents. He felt disconnected from the natural world. He felt lonely in London, and he hopes that his small child will grow up in a world much different and will feel communion with the natural world, communion with people. Now, I'm, I'm providing this background to set up a, a, a discussion of how Coleridge envisions the difference between um, time as a force of unity, and time is a force of division. And this will take us, I hope, into Coleridge's imagination and help us understand in particular the plight of the ancient mariner who is all alone on the wide, wide sea for much of the poem until he he suddenly has this moment where he blesses the water snakes uh, unaware. And sure, my kind saint took pity on me. I blessed them unaware. And at that point, the, the, head, the albatross, which he'd been wearing as a necklace as a sign of his sin and isolation, falls away. In 1823, uh, Coleridge writes a letter that, that has this to say about time as divisive. 
about time as a sort of string of meaningless moments that have no continuity, that have no unity. Um, a series of present moments, a series of nows, we might say, um, in which each particular now has no intrinsic relationship to what came before and what will come after. He says that to feel real despair is to feel time and existence in this way as a friable, I mean, you can break something up easily, it's friable, friable, incohesive sort of existence, a fractional life made up of successive moments that neither blend nor modify each other, a life that is strictly symbolized in the thread of sand through the orifice of the hourglass, in which the sequence of grains only counterfeits a continuity and appears a line only because the interspaces between the points are too small to be sensible. So in this image, each moment is like a sand in the hourglass falling through uh, the, the, the hole that divides the, the upper and the lower. And because these, these bits of sand are so close together and they're falling, there's the illusion that they are continuous. But in fact, they're not. Each moment is sort of is self-contained and has no meaningful relationship to the grain that came before it and the grain um, that will come after. So, so this is despair for Coleridge. We might call it depression or, or melancholy. Is the, is the feeling that, that life is just sort of one damn thing after another. Now, now, now. It's as if you're sitting and watching TV and you're, you're channel surfing. You've got 300 channels and nothing is interesting at all. But you just keep channel surfing anyway. Uh, but nothing grabs your attention. Nothing pulls you in. No narrative uh, calls you, uh, stokes your imagination. So this is how the mariner feels out alone on the wide, wide sea. And I think this is one reason why in the, the ancient mariner, time is so weird. Things just seem to happen with no causality at all. The mariner shows up at the, at the wedding and sees the wedding guest and says, there was a ship. Like, what? <laughs> there's no context for that. It just, it just emerges into the poem as if there's no causality. Same with the, the killing of the albatross. There's no warning whatsoever for the mariner shooting this albatross. He talks about the albatross being down in the Antarctic in the land of mist and snow and how the mariners train the albatross to eat their food and to come to their call. And then suddenly he says, I shot the albatross. Like, what? Where did that come from? And I think another manifestation of, of, of time as, as sort of uh, just all these unrelated fragments occurs when we see uh, death and life in death um, approach the, the ship of, of the sailors and a game die or cast and death wins all the crew and they die and life and death wins the mariner which means he's not going to die literally but he'll be sort of emotionally dead and that's that's what happens so chance um a causality and this is what happens in, in in gambling say so the the the, the goal of the of the mariner, the desire of the mariner is to try to overcome this isolation. And we imagine it might come again when he blesses the water snakes unaware. The fact that he blesses them unaware is important. This is a moment where he's not trying to impose his ego onto the world. It's, it's sort of, sort of unconscious, unconscious energies are bubbling up. And he sees these water snakes twirling in the water. Uh, they, they're making vortical forms. They're like eddies or whirlpools. And this will become a, an ongoing symbol for Coleridge of, of unity of opposites, the, the eddy or, or the vortex or the whirlpool. Um, this idea that the problem of life is the separation of self and other, um, human and nature. And what can bring these together? Well, sometimes Coleridge will offer a metaphysical account suggesting there's something like spirit or mind that unifies everything in the world. 
but also there's a sense in a more secular context that imagination, my ability to imagine what it's like to be you, can overcome this division. So if we think about then Coleridge's uh, fear of hourglass time, um, what would be the opposite of hourglass time? Well, in a poem uh, called Limbo, which Coleridge wrote in his notebook, never showed up, never was never published during his lifetime, um, Coleridge contrasts hourglass time with what he calls human time. Um, now, it's a very complicated take on human time in that poem. I won't go into it, except to say that human time is time in, in which the present moment seems to grow elegantly from the past and look with anticipation toward the future. The sense that time is, is, is unified, that there is a sense of development, um, teleology, um, a move toward a certain end, goal, or purpose. This is meaningful time. Uh, the, the hope that tomorrow something will happen that grows out of what's happening today. And what's happening today is a manifestation, an extension of what happened yesterday. So the sense that past, present, and future are part of some sort of um, whole uh, of that moving toward a, a particular purpose. So one problem with Coleridge in his own mental health as, as, as he developed throughout life was that it's almost as if he craved this unity with others and with the world so much that he set up unrealistic expectations. It's as if he could not be intimate enough with others, especially those he really loved, like Wordsworth. And because of that, he would become frustrated. It was almost like the, 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 um, you know, the exclusion of the middle. It's either wonderful unity or it's painful division. And just to, to think in this kind of divisive way, I think really contributed to, to Coleridge's very deep depressions throughout most of his life um, and therefore contributed to his opium addiction, which he would, which was draw, which emerges from his despair. He wanted to ease his pain, so he took opium. So it, it's, I'm moving from talking about Coleridge's poetry, the Mariner in particular, to his life. And one of the great ironies is that Coleridge was desperate for unity, uh, whereas his friend Wordsworth didn't seem to desire it nearly as much. But whereas Coleridge often felt himself to be alone and isolated because others couldn't meet his often ravenous needs, um, Wordsworth, who seemed not to care too much um, about community with others, was deeply beloved <laughs> by those around him, in particular the women around him. Uh, Dorothy, his sister, adored him. Um, his wife, Mary, adored him. And the sister of his wife, Mary, Sarah, also adored him. Um, sadly, Coleridge fell in love with the sister of Wordsworth's wife, and that, that ended, well, it didn't end. It was an ongoing tragedy. So there you go, um, two different ways of thinking about time and a way of thinking about um, Coleridge's interest in unity um, and isolation in his early poetry, in particular around the ancient mariner, and also just a way of accounting, one way of accounting for some of the darker parts of Coleridge's life.